Burgess here with Music Marketing TV. Today we're going to be taking a look at how to make this sound with Phase Plant. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna be checking out how to make that. So that gives you an idea of sort of what it is by itself. Uh, so let's really quick run down the general idea of what the heck's going on here. Uh, let's start off at the end of the chain and actually work our way the other way because there's a number of things we kind of have to turn off. So starting off at the very end, we have an L2. This thing is just there for mastering purposes. I wanted to slam it pretty dang hard. And I wanted you to hear it kind of in the context I intended the patch to be in. Uh, so we'll turn that off. This originally was actually part of a sound design session where I wanted to make 10 sounds and I got really distracted with, with one. <laughs> so uh, then we hit what's called the pavement slammer. That's what I've named this. In fact, I think I'm going to extend the patch out and add a couple more macros and save it as like a, a real proper preset. But in here, there is the snare side chain and the kick side chain. They are just uh, for the side chains. If you listen, this is the setting I settled on for the kick uh, or for the snare side chain. <laughs> And you can hear that brightness drop. Now, this is something that's important to keep in, uh, note of uh, when we, like, here's with the mastering back on. It's gonna get so much bigger and brighter, and you have to keep that in mind. You can mitigate this by just monitoring louder when you're working with things that you know you're gonna be slamming pretty hard. Uh, I like to sometimes put something there to just get a quick little preview. Uh, but yeah, always be ready for the end because uh, it'll really change a lot. So side chains, anyways, these two cause pumping that dramatically affects how the patch will bounce. And that's gonna change the kind of rhythms and riffs you're probably gonna wanna write. So I like to, when making a patch like this, that's going to probably um, have quite a bit of pumping built into it via whatever drums I have, um, set that up. So there are these two side chains without them uh, masking galore. So you just hear everything just takes a backseat because the, the bass is so dang big. You got to pick something. I went with a sidechain solution. You can do things with an EQ. There are a lot of options. Just a, kind of a quick and dirty one. And then the last thing that's outside of face plant is I have here a, uh, a Maximus. And the Maximus has the highs pulled up, the mids pulled down a bit, and the lows pulled up, uh, surprisingly. And I just like the balance this gave. Um... It's just simply, I, I didn't view this as much of a compression move as I did sort of as a weird EQ move, even though it is Maximus and it's going to, you know, it's a multiband compressor. I kind of view it like that sometimes, uh, just with a different lens. And so that's why that's here. I really like um, just being able to pull the envelopes up. Often I don't touch anything. I'm just like, just, just adjust those things. Uh, so this is with just the Maximus. <laughs> And at this point, let's lose the drums since they're not going to be of help to us anymore. And without it. So a lot of mids. I, If you're going to do something like this, you got to pick something to scoop out. The sound is massive. It's huge. You got to remove something so you have room for other things in your track, especially if you, know, if you want drums to come through. You're gonna need to carve it out a bit. So anyways, that's what all these moves are, I'd call them. Carving moves, picking out some interesting spectrums, uh, and then a mastering move. So after that, we hit the actual plugin itself. And let's take a look at the MIDI real quick. So this patch is made to be monophonic. The polyphony has been set to one. I have it on legato, and I have a glide time of 358 milliseconds. This glide is super important because it makes it so that in the polyphony being one, so that notes slide when they overlap. So you can see there's the overlap, and that's what gives us those nice bends. 
Only when they overlap though, which is uh, which is a pretty nice thing. So that is the behavior of the patch. Now inside it, there is one force driving the rhythm, um, but there are many things driving the, the thing that drives that. So the rhythm itself is fundamentally an LFO changing an FM amount. That's all that it is. So you see these high frequencies showing up and it is this um, modulating this. And that is being driven by an LFO. Uh, so that is what, by the way, this wobble speed is. I hooked it up to a macro, automated it. I like to do it through the macros. And there are, you know, it's just different rhythms, uh, generally in the one to four sixteenths area. And uh, yeah, so you can hear the rhythms come in and out. I liked uh, working with the synced version. I played around with the unsynced, but it just sounded cooler with the synced. Uh, and that's what it is. So some long stuff for tones where I want patterns to come through. And you're gonna see here, I've got a, a low band and a high band um, here. And that's actually Maximus being moved around. Right here, see these? Right here, get a high or a low, that's the low one. But anyways, these move around and change where this curve comes in and out. So I'm gonna go ahead and take that off. But that's what these are. So I wrote out my part and then I wanted it to ebb and flow and have different things at different spots. So I often like to move these around. And because I boosted the lows and the highs, um, and by moving these around, I change where that hole, the mid band is, the thing that's being taken out, and it acts as a kind of like additional filter for me. So I like to do that kind of stuff. So that's what's going on there. Sort of picked to go with the drums and what I thought made sense with the rhythm that I wrote. Um, and so fundamentally, we have a FM driven LFO patch. Like it's essentially what's going on. So continuing our way backwards, uh, we hit our effects. So the effects stack is pretty straightforward. It is simply a distortion EQ stack. And again, I'm scooping out mids, low mids, uh, hugely, just creating a big pocket uh, for other things to go in so that it, it makes sense in a mix rather than just being this monstrous thing that takes up all the space. Uh, there is a multi-pass on this. And on multi-pass, I often like to mess with the not or the not OTT. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's like the OTT inside of multi-pass, right? Uh, it's just a patch I like grabbing. I almost never even go right in it. I just start adjusting things according to what I like. And in this case, I actually really like Snap. At the time, I was messing with a much more percussive patch when I was making it. But the bottom um, start of the things is being helped out by Snap. If we get rid of this, I honestly don't think it's going to be that big a deal. But let's go first over to these two. It'll, the snap, I mean, won't be as big a deal. Um, there will be a timbre change for sure. So if we take out the distortion and the three band EQ. Now you see the three band EQ sort of doing a little wiggle, a, a jiggle wiggle. And that is the random, or no, is this the random? No, this is the LFO. The LFO has been connected to these things. And it's just to give some extra motion, changing it um, to help out the wobble. Um, I have the mids moving. It'd be cool to have the whole move. And you see, I've got this concept of a, a part of the spectrum being removed um, to create sort of space and rhythm in a couple places. Here it's more like phrase wise where this is more driven by the LFO. So anything tied to this is gonna be the rhythm of the patch. Uh, so that's what's going on there. I thought about doing a double stat because there are more down here. It's cool, but maybe for a variation, but I didn't have it in the final version you heard. Um, so let's just lose these two for the moment because they kind of come as a package. The distortion itself is just an overdrive. It's got some stereo and the dynamics are driven quite a ways up, which really preserves the, the patch. You can hear how much having that EQ gone does with that scoop. Huge, huge, huge things. Uh, so if we take that off, we take the distortion off. Yeah. 
Now, the OTT is pulling crap up for us um, big time. So if you're not familiar with OTT, it's over the top compression. It's basically upwards and downwards compression at the same time. So stuff that's not soft gets pulled up. Stuff that's too loud gets pushed down and you push it into this region and it creates this super just squash to heck thing. And that's why it's over the top. And if we take that off, um, that'll go away. It's very popular with sounds like this because it does wondrous things to them. Uh, we hit a phaser. Now, the notion behind a phaser, uh, this is in a lot of patches I do, interesting ways of adding phase. In this case, it's just a straight up phaser. I, I just, you know, put a high depth, messed with the rate and the cutoff, found a spot where we get some nice juicy phasing through the sound. And then I... They typically really work well during bends. And so by this time I had had the line written. So I was dialing in a phaser to that line. Um, let's just hear it with just try listen for the phasing. Yeah, now we'll get rid of it. Here it is now. Now there's still a little, you can notice a quite a bit of the movement left. There's still a touch of the movement that comes from this unison um, is really helping out because it creates eight copies. It's been detuned and spread. I settled on the hard setting. Uh, there were there's a bunch in here. Uh, I went with hard and spread is uh, rather spread out and the detune is actually way higher than I thought I was going to go, but it just works out. Uh, but before we get over here, just wanted to explain where some of the extra motion was coming from. Uh, we have a distortion. So the distortion, it's a drive control, and that's that's what I'm going for here, right? Just pump the heck up, because what we're feeding into this thing is pretty tiny. So that's the raw input, and you can really hear, oh man, it sounds like a flanger of like, a chorus in a, a flange and a chorus have very similar operating principles. One's a variation in pitch, one's a variation in time. At some levels, they're kind of the same thing, the process that produces these things. Um, and you can really hear it there. So if you lose this, you can hear what a huge difference the unison makes. We put it back. Night and day, night and day, it's such a big difference. And in fact, these could be cool as a cool way to just split and make multiple patches. Like you could take this, turn off just this and use it in some spots and then other spots use the unison out version. And you'd have two sounds that are very similar but they're obviously very distinctly different and just, just great tools, ways to make things fit together easily without having to redesign, you know, like an entire another patch. So anyways, that is the, the unison there. It makes a lot of sense to sort of talk about it here because this is the stage where I started looking at things. So we'll take the unison off and we will now look at the FM itself. There's another unison here on the bias. We will get to that in a second. Or not the bias, I should say, the, uh, the, the modulator, right? So this is going to be our carrier and it's being modulated by this. So... The FM. The FM is a triangle wave. You could try a bunch of different types of wave, but our source sound is this thing. And I, once I had this, I thought I had enough motion to really do something cool. So it is simply a sine wave modulating a triangle wave. Like that's it. It's it's really straightforward, but at the same time, it isn't. Uh, these are the types of settings you sit here. The reason why I don't really want to recreate this from scratch because I'm not really sure I could. Because it is one of those things you sit there for a long time dialing in values and you start dialing in effects and you come back and you you do this back and forth dance trying to find just the right around amount of motion. And it's always sort of a fun game to figure out what is that beginning root timbre that's really going to give you the power to expand it later. So the amount here, it's connected up to a few things, right? So there is an envelope driving this partially, and there is an LFO driving this partially. 
And they both come in and you see this is barely moving. You see like 11%. Barely touches it. There is a smidge of sink in there. If we get rid of the sink. It's not going to be a big deal because the sink doesn't move. Put it back. The sink gets, the reason the sink makes a difference in the timbre is because it changes the wave shape and FMing, um, the wave shape is going to change a lot of things. So, because it's based on a, a derivative, if we're getting mathy here. So the sink's always kind of a fun one to just touch up every now and then just a little bit. Uh, if you're unfamiliar, when you add a sink, it basically looks like you're squishing more of the waves inside of itself. See how it kind of looks like there's more appearing inside of them? That's how I just think of sink. There's like a more technically correct way to describe this, I'm sure. Uh, but when I see it, that's what I think of. So there you go. So the sink's barely up, and that's all that's, 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 all that's there. It feeds into a filter. I spent way, way, way too long messing with filters. I ended up choosing the biased filter. There, a bunch of them sound so cool, though. Uh, this is specifically the nonlinear filter. Uh, where are you at? Nonlinear filter. And it makes all kinds of crazy noises when you push the cue up and the drive up. And I liked what bias did the most for me. For example, here it is just on bias. And it should be noted that this is a high pass filter trying to tame some of those low end because you see the low end gets introduced over and over as you do distortion stacks. So I generally remove quite a bit of it early because I know it's going to come back anyways. So uh, that's biased. Let's go over to tubular. And let's try out, I don't know, let's try another. Here's fuzzy. Another one where you could simply change just a few settings and have a very different patch that kind of has a similar feel. So we'll go back to biased. I liked biased the most in this case. And it will act as a, sort of a static effect. There is an envelope driving this thing down here. And originally the envelope did a lot of other things, but I took all those things off and just had it solely to drive the filter. And I just had it turn the filter on over time to give us a unique sort of starting attack to the sound. And that's it. It wound up being a much simpler filter before it was connected to a whole bunch. You can see here it actually has rain over the phase modulation here as well. Uh, but it, it's just turned on to control that over time. So that it doesn't just start off at whatever modulation. It has a transition into that modulation. So that's the filter. And that's what's going on here. And that's how I picked the mode. It wasn't like some great, uh, like I foresaw it. I actually changed this a lot. Uh, to get the final sound. And then we come to the probably the most interesting thing here. We have the actual carrier. So the carrier is extremely high. I tuned it the crap up. It is almost a 60 and it's got a very slight amount of random variation. This is to keep things from getting static. If we get rid of this, um, it sits much more steel. We put that back. Yeah, you hear these little like variations. This is the the smallest bit. You can see random minus one point two. It's gonna vary by that amount, super super tiny, but it adds that extra little bit of motion. The other thing that's big for this is the sync is moving with the LFO. And this, remember, has that wave scrunching property. And since FM is a wave shape dependent process, because it's dependent on a derivative, this is going to um, have some interesting properties to what's going on up here because it's, it. I'm not even sure how to put this into words. I think of bright high frequencies when I turn this knob up. That's what I think of. Uh, because it's going to be increasing the frequency sort of here and the type of wave you pick this is going to have really different effects because if a line is smooth the fm will be smooth if the line has is just straight lines like this one you'll get two distinct tones but if you have lines that have discontinuities 
or or straight you know just straight drops when you add sync it's going to add some additional dr like straight lines in occasionally and this will result in very um much brighter timbre suddenly showing up for uh, math reasons but so i went with the sine wave let me just show you here's the sine wave triangle will also sound good so there's triangle here's square And here is the saw. So you see these two have like way crazier uh, upper register stuff going on. Um, and in that case, I'd probably change range and all this other stuff. Uh, but I like the sine wave. I went with that. But these are interesting options. Definitely some things to possibly fiddle with. Uh, up here, we have the just the carrier. And I've, I've already kind of talked about the carrier and the whole philosophy behind it. That's pretty much the patch. That's what each thing does. Hopefully you're able to follow that. I should also say the notes here are pretty low. Um, if we were to write these notes higher, the FM just doesn't quite work because of how high this carrier is. The fact that we're writing things so low and then tuning them up so high, that's kind of what makes it work. I experimented with bringing this down um, a ton and adjusting this so that I could write MIDI notes maybe in a, in a spot that makes more sense. But I found that the most useful way of doing this was to have these lower because it's more valuable to be able to go up because going down just turns into a noisy mess. Not a lot of reason to sacrifice a useful upper register to this. Like occasionally you could come up here for cool riffs and stuff. And this is so dang low that this is actually pretty usable. Anything past this is going to be completely, you probably won't ever use it. So that's kind of why I left it in the range it is. I thought about moving it around and decided it was not worth the trouble. And I liked where it was. The downside is, is when you're playing the patch, like as a preset, um, it, if you're, you know, not changing the range of your keyboard, it's just not going to be that great. So Preset browsing wise makes it a little trickier if you have it as a preset. So I often like to put things in the description like play low, low bass thing, play low notes or something. Um, that's how I like to do it because I actually prefer this for, for the reasons I just said. But anyways, that's the patch. I call it pavement slammer, uh, but putting everything back, we'll, we'll go ahead and add on things one at a time so you can sort of hear it come together. So, you know, we're, we're here, we add our distortion. And we put our, well, let's put our unison on first. So we, we put our unison back. Put our distortion, phaser, multi There you see. Bring our drums in. If you have any questions about this, feel free to let me know. Subscribe and hit that bell icon for future videos and have a blessed day.